Woo! Oh, when the Saints. That was for you. That was definitely for you. Saints going to the Super Bowl. That was for you. I don't know. Um, How's everybody? Good. You moderating? Yeah. Can I ask you a couple questions? Yeah, ask me about my how's leadership, it, my leadership you, of New Orleans. How's your leadership yeah. at the Atlantic? Yeah, you know, well? yeah. It's easier to run the Atlantic <laughs> than New Orleans, I bet. Um, so, so let's uh, let's just jump right right into uh, to our main subject. I mean, the, your book is about the uh, state of America in a lot of ways, and so let's just talk about the state of America. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about the people who vote for Trump. Let's make the assumption in this conversation um, that white people who vote for Trump are not all racist, not evil, not this, not that. Uh, what is motivating, and you have a lot of people in Louisiana who support Trump, what motivates their, their, their love of Trump? What motivates their fears of what's happening in America today? Talk about that for a minute. Well, it's a great question, and thank you for it. Um, backing up from that a little bit, everybody remembers that not too long ago we had Operation Wall Street. People were really agitated on the left. People now are really agitated on the right. If you hear President Trump talk about it, everything's great. Stock market's up, except for the last couple of days. <laughs> um, everything's great. You know, the world's a beautiful place. Well, why is everybody so unhappy? And why is everybody fighting everybody? And, what, and, and, and in fact, are they? Or is there a uh, kind of a binary thing going on between people that are talking about federal issues and people that are, that are living locally? And it's a very interesting question. I, I think your assumption is correct. I don't think everybody that supports President Trump um, is a racist. I do think that he, he extols a very uh, loud dog whistle for people who live in that white supremacy nationalist world, which is a very dangerous place for us to go, and we're in a very dangerous place as it relates to that. But there are other individuals who I've asked and talked to, and they said, you know what, I, I don't really care what y'all say about his behavior or whether he tells the truth or not tells the truth. You know, it sounds like he's listening to me. It, sound, it feels like he sees me right. and he's paying attention to me and that other people are not. Um, at some point in time, you have to begin to ask yourself, you know, what price glory? You know, what cost? Uh, what are you willing to receive in order to denigrate other people? I think that calculation will wear off you know, in America, I'm praying that it will, uh, and, I, and I think that it will. Do you think that, um, I mean, people throw around the term civil war pretty lightly these days. Um, they certainly talk about the bifurcation of America, two Americas. Uh, you ha you're a student of the Civil War. You were directly involved in, in some ways, in one of the directly. last battles of the Civil War, the battle over the statues in New Orleans. Uh, do you think that we're headed toward a kind of permanent national fracturing, or do you think that we're going to wake up five years from now and say, well, that, that was a weird moment, but we got through that? I think, I, think we're, I think we're witnessing a death gurgle. The death gurgle? Yeah, what is of, of, of white supremacy and white nationalism in America. I think it doesn't feel that way. I would say this, let me, let me make a couple of broader points about it. First of all, if you live in a city like New Orleans, and by the way, there are 1,400 cities that have 30,000 or more people, and I know that uh, the Fallows were up here a little while ago talking about their book in the heartland. There is magnificent stuff going on in big cities and small cities, which by the way, depend on rural folks, and, they, and we depend on each other. So there's a codependency where we live, where we talk, where we play. Then on the national level, in the federal government, which is broken beyond repair, that doesn't really reflect what's happening on the streets of America. So in one instance, we're completely separated. If you look at Fox and you look at CNN, you say we have no future. But if you get down on the ground tomorrow in any city in America and go to a community event, there'll be white people, black people, Jew, Muslim, Christian, hanging out together. You go, well, really, are we that far apart? I think we are on President Trump. And I think that he is flaming, although he's not the cause of it, he's flaming this notion. And, his, and it's really simple. He's, you should just take him at his word. Just listen to what he says. He is who he says he is. He said he was going to take the country back again, comma, again. If you're from the South, that means to a time when there were a lot of other people that weren't participating. That's exactly what he's doing. He actually is, believes as a strategy that division and dehumanization wins, and up to this point, it has. The question is not what he's gonna keep doing, the question is, what's the rest of America gonna to do to respond to that? Are we gonna to submit to it, which it seems like we have? Maybe next Tuesday, you'll kinda of change the trajectory. I just 
I have enough faith in the American citizen to know that at some point we're going to understand that hating each other is exhausting. Let me ask you And this. it's not going to get us in a good place. Let me ask you about complicity. Now, obviously, in the Pittsburgh synagogue massacre, the shooter is the shooter. There's the responsibility. Uh, do you believe that President Trump has any responsibility for creating a climate in which this sort of thing takes place? Well, not by himself and not directly. However, when you start to give fuel to or you give space for, or you don't actively condemn, then in that way, we're kind of all complicit. And so I would just say this to the, to the people in this room and really to the people of America. You have to choose common ground. You have to want it. You have to work to it. It doesn't come by itself. And by the way, neither does freedom. I mean, you don't just go, I'll wake up and we're free. You're free because people have, made, have, have paid a great price. And as a matter of fact, one of the interesting things President Trump has done is, is, is taken the term patriotism and actually turned it on its head and actually is, is praising a false patriotism. Patriotism in America means that you have a right to criticize your government. It means the press should do its job of holding people accountable. That's very American. It's not un-American. It's very American to make sure that you treat everybody equally. It's un-American to say that we're gonna treat you differently because of your race, your creed, your color. When a leader, or anybody else, whether it's a political leader, a business leader, a faith-based leader judges people based on race, creed, color, sexual orientation, and vilifies them and dehumanizes them. They're invading the country. Muslim are terrorists. Black people are criminals. These kinds of things. Then there is an extremist group of people that will find light where they never used to have it, and unless you shut that down in an aggressive way, it will rise up. And you all don't need to be told this, but you know this, that human beings have done awful things to each other in places all over the world throughout history when you allow that to flourish. You have to actively say that that's not who we are. And to the extent that you don't say that, or to the extent that you continue to say that's okay, then in a very broad term, I think that you can say that you're complicit, not just him, but, but anybody else that participates in that. Have you ever seen a president in the modern era no, at this level? No, this of is what insane. You would think You've never seen anything like this. And it's really bad for the country. It's bad for the world. Because what's different about what maybe I would say or another person who's not the president is, you're not the president. The president is, by all measures, the most important and the most powerful political person in the world. And his words matter, not only to the people in the United States, but they matter to the people in the world. And when you give license, then people take license. And you have to speak against that, not for it. I wanna stay on the subject of, of white people for a minute. Um, <laughs> you are, um, you are a pretty rare bird these days. You're a Southern Christian white male Democrat. Who, uh, very uh, rare bird. Extreme, extremely rare bird. Like, I think they're one of us yeah, left. They, they, you got out of the New Orleans Zoo somehow <laughs> today, and you're, here you are. Uh, the, take, take us inside the mentality of, look, inside your city, we know, and you, know, you can recap this at greater length than me, obviously, but... Uh, inside the city, there was support for your decision to remove Confederate statues. Yeah. Um, in the broader state, the majority of whites were against this. Talk about the persistence of Confederate romanticism. Talk about the persistence of what you and I would probably think of as outright racism, dog whistling racism, that oh. sort of thing. W is it ever expunged? Well, first of all, if based on polls that have been done nationally, about 65% of the people in the country, which is mostly white at the moment, not so much in 2040, um, thinks that they should not come down. So that's interesting. Now, when I was asking people, you know, why they didn't, there were some people who were just straight up uh, advocates of the Confederacy. But a lot of people were like, I don't even know what they are, but it looks like a nice statue. And I was there, you know, for Mardi Gras with my father. So why are you taking that down? And what does it really mean? the more people have gotten to know what they really stand for, why they were put up for the specific purpose of sending a message that African-Americans were less than, then people started saying, well, I didn't know that. They really never taught me that. And I think if you talk to your mothers or your fathers or your grandpas or grandmas, they'll say, I never really understood that history the way you, you explained Do it. Do one turn on this, your argument that uh, the statues, removing the statues is not erasing history, it's actually liberating. Well, it, it, it's, it's, actually, it's, actually, it's actually making straight what was crooked. See, what happened was the Civil War was fought. And some people want to continue to argue about why it was fought. Well, the first thing it was fought for was to destroy the country. 
I think we can agree that had the Confederacy won, the United States as we knew it would have fractured. So it was against the United States. So it was kind of weird to me that the people that were for the Confederacy were carrying the American flag because you can't do both of those really at the same time because one of them was to destroy the country and then one of them was to unite. The second reason is it was done to preserve slavery. Now, some people want to hide behind the myth that somehow it was economic, but it was economic because it was based <laughs> on slavery. And so I don't know why it's hard for the country or anybody in the country to say simply this, the Confederacy was fought to destroy the country for the sake of preserving slavery. And if that's what it was for, then we as Americans could say that was wrong. It was a mistake without feeling like that you were somehow personally responsible. But people for some reason feel it really, really hard, like they did in South Africa um, with apartheid, like they did in Germany uh, after the Holocaust of saying, we made a historical error. Now, if you're an African American, and somebody can't even say to you, I'm sorry, I agree that that was a mistake. It's kind of hard to think, well, I've got a pathway forward. And the same thing is true, by the way, even though in this instance we're talking about prejudice against African Americans, um, that when you start to vilify people because they're Hispanic or be, on their religion because they're Muslim, that it's all the seed of hate, and the hate is the tree. And the rest of it's just fruit from the poisonous tree. And the big question is whether or not we're better hating each other, or we're better getting along together. I just think that as a matter, of, forget about the moral justification, which I think is really strong. When you think ahead to 2040 and the demographic changes that are coming in the country and you ask yourself, are we preparing ourselves well to get along with each other in 2040 so that we can have commerce and beautiful cities and smart cities and technology and data? I would just kind of say this very simple thing. It's gonna be really, really, really hard for us to live together and to work together if we hate each other and if we're scared of each other. That's not really a good prescription for economic success going forward or for the United States of America to continue to be the strongest country that ever was. What is the, um, talk a little bit about the Democrats and their problem with race or the problem in attracting white males in particular to their cause. Uh, again, you have some skin in the game in, in yeah. this question. I'm not suggesting that you're running for president in two years, yeah. but uh, I'm suggesting that maybe you're running for president. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, how do you get over that, that hump that, that has so many white males across America uh, thinking this party is my enemy? They want to change things too fast. I, they're not patriotic. They don't stand for anything that I believe in anymore. Well, first of all, I don't think it's correct that all white men are, for, are conservative and Republican. No, no, of course not. But there, there there's are, a large number. As a matter of fact, put, the Trump put, base putting, is a white male base. Put, put Trump a couple years ahead of us, and the monument's a couple years ahead of us. If you were running for mayor of New Orleans, the way that you could win is to get two thirds of the African American vote and one third of the white vote which meant two thirds of the white vote was against you. That's the way my father got elected in 1970. I actually was a very rare in this sense that I actually got 66% of both the white and the black community. It's the first time that ever happened. Actually in the history of New Orleans where African Americans and whites in equal numbers voted for the same person. It's highly unusual. The reverse is also true. If you were gonna win on the other side, you always put coalitions. So it's not unusual to have coalitions. I do think it's true that there is a, there is a certain sense now that white men have about we're getting dispossessed. Because there's a lot of talk about, about diversity. And diversity, if you really kind of reel it down, means you gotta move over and let somebody else participate. I don't think it's a zero sum game though. I always thought that the more you added to the pot, the more you had. That, that's just kind of what, I have, I'm, from, I'm from a family of nine. And, and when somebody used to come over for dinner, it wasn't like, no, you can't come because there's not enough. It was always mama adding a little bit of gravy, you know, water to the pot, and you know, we serve gumbo, we really do eat gumbo in the, in the South. A little, everybody was welcome, and the more people that came, the bigger the pot got, and we, we believe, like, this is really kind of weird to me. Some of the conservative Republicans think about a growth economy, right? Well, why don't they think that every, every, everything else grows like that? I mean, it's supposed to grow, it's not a zero-sum game. And, I just have, from coming from New Orleans, which is a very, you know, deeply rich, multicultural, ethnic thing, a rising tide in that sense does lift all boats. But you have another weird thing going on, which is kind of crisscrossing, which is the economy right now is not really lifting everybody up. You see this weird juxtaposition, and you, we're back to the age old fight about whether or not African Americans and whites who are on the so, same socioeconomic scale should be friends or should they be enemies. 
And the Republican Party politically, purposefully in 1972, started with Richard Nixon, the Southern strategy of separating people based on race. If you make people afraid of each other, this sounds familiar, the caravan's coming, we should be afraid of them, it's a national security threat. We've got to do tariffs with Canada because we're really scared of the Canadians, which by the way, if, I don't know if you knew this, but it was right next door to us. They're kind of coming across the border. Also, I don't know if you know this, our, they're not actually yeah, right, scary. Right, oh, they're not actually scary. Everything's a national security threat. Well, I will say this to you without you getting panicked because I don't think we're gonna get there, but this is the way autocracies start. You should be afraid and I'm gonna save you. And oh, by the way, you gotta give up your civil liberties a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And oh, by the way, the press can't criticize us. And oh, by the way, everybody else is invading us. And oh, by the way, I'm accumulating more power. And oh, by the way, I think I can amend the Constitution of the United States with the stroke of a pen because you see, we're not a democracy anymore, but now we're an autocracy. That thing, if that keeps going on, it leads someplace. Question is, where is it leading? And if it's not gonna lead that way, why don't we keep doing that? And so essentially what has to happen, this is where I think the Democrats in some instances make a mistake. I think that the notion of using the 25th Amendment or the notion of using impeachment, look, we're in a democracy. You win or lose by going to vote. And if you don't go show up to vote, you know, it's not, you can go. And we're having elections now. And if people are unhappy with the direction of the country, you can send a message next week. And then if you're unhappy two years from now, you can send another message. That, and you have to win in the marketplace of ideas. Your party should be doing a lot better than it's doing, considering that we have this unique kind of presidency in front of us. Why is it? Well, that's, why, 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 why is, that's why one is view. Senate, I'll give you another that's view. That's one view. Yes, That's one is, view. Here's, well, you let me disagree get, with that view. No, I want to just give you another view. <laughs> Pretty good, don't you think? <laughs> Here's another view. If, 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 why is President Trump below 50% when unemployment is at its lowest, the stock market is at its highest? Why, why is he at below water? Now think about that. I mean, really, he should be where President Bush was in 1992 when he ran for re-election. He ought to be at like 80%. Because the country feels there's something not really comfortable about this, that this deal that we have, you know, some of us will do a little bit better if we close our eyes, that the price is really worth paying, but I'm not sure how far do I let it go. Everybody's kind of feeling weird about that. And my sense is, is because he's really starting to scrape at the conscience of the country and saying, how far do we really want to push this thing? And, uh, and I think we really have to think about that. Like, it's okay that some of us are doing better, but do you really want to do it at the price of dehumanizing everybody else that doesn't look like you What's if you're a white person in America. I don't think that's, that's really not who we are as a country. We really are a country of immigrants. I mean, we really are when you dig down deep and you, and you scrape everybody a little bit. We all look a little different. We all come from a bunch of different places. And we all believe that this whole notion of e pluribus unum is really kind of right, even though we don't get it right all the time. We mess up, but we try harder. We don't aggressively say, no, we didn't really mean that at all. Like, no, you're not welcome here because you don't look like me. That nobody, I don't, I've never seen that in the, I didn't see that, you know, in, in, in any of the founding documents. What's the, what's the most surprising thing about the last couple of years to you? I mean, which coincide, your, 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 your national sized drama in New Orleans actually coincided with the rise of what you might call white resentment politics, not the, or the, yeah. the resurgence of white resentment. Well, we, what's, the most, what's the most surprising thing in all of this? Well, first of all, we didn't really feel it that because New Orleans is a very multicultural open place. Um, but but I was, felt I was, the suburbs ringing New Orleans. Oh, no question. I was, very, I was very surprised that President Trump got elected. That really surprised me and it bummed me out. Um, <laughs> And, and, and then I was surprised a lot because if you get elected president, I mean, you got something going for you. I mean, as, as much as people don't want to even give him credit for anything, I mean, he got elected president of the United States. That's pretty good. And then I thought the majesty of the office is so awesome and so powerful that it would form any human being into a, a better human being. And that, do, that doesn't seem to have happened either. <laughs> No, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm really not trying to joke, but it doesn't seem that his instincts, so today I, I didn't see the funeral. I'm praying that he rose to the occasion that the country expects of our presidents and helped a grieving nation heal after a tragic set of circumstances. You may remember uh, that President Obama went to Dallas after five police officers were killed in July of 2016. Very, very hard thing because as you may recall, at that time, there was a lot of contention between police departments and the community, 
and President Obama was being criticized for being, you know, very thoughtful about young African American that were being killed, and there was the Blue Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter, but he showed up, and he gave a really, really, really powerful speech to the country where we took a moment and remembered the lives lost, and presidents have to do that, and I'm really just kind of praying, I really mean this, that I hope that today the president rose above Unfortunately, today he decided to start taking citizenship away from such and such. Those mixed messages can confuse a nation when the president says, well, I want to heal, but I want to fight too. And I don't think that that's really great. I wish that he would just do better at Do you that. think it's possible? you think there's a learning curve? I, I used to think so. I'm, I'm thinking that, not, that he is who he is. So give, given, I don't, given I don't that, think so. I don't, given who I, he I hope is, not. which is, among other things, an effective communicator to his base. Yeah. Given... given the state of the, the, the mass democratization and instantaneous speed of, of, the, of the internet, of the web, um, given the global rise of autocracy, given economic dislocation and fear, uh, how do you, and I'm not asking this specifically about you as- How does uh, one? How, yeah, how does one go to the suburbs of New Orleans, where a lot of white people who used to live in New Orleans now live, who might disagree with you about your view about the Confederacy and the statues. Sure. How do you convince people against all of these forces that the future of America is, as you say, as you argue, better if we overcome racial, ethnic, regional differences and try to remember what unites us rather than divides us? Seriously, what is the, what's the message that, would, that, would, that might work? I don't, well, a couple things that I want to highlight. One, it was embedded in Jeffrey's question. This, this notion of white supremacy and nationalism, this is a worldwide movement. That's why it's so incredibly dangerous. Because if, if those things find each other across nations and across common leaders, we, we could really have ourselves in a place that we really don't want to be, where a flash could cause a major military conflict. You don't, you don't want to put yourself, so as a mayor, one of the things you really wanted to work hard to do is don't ever put yourself in a position where you're going to have to, or be part of creating a situation that you don't want to have to react to. And we're not being very smart about that. In your lives, you should be proactive. The second thing I would say about it, and I really don't mean to be trite about this, that the answer to that question is not really complicated, it's just hard to do. And I think Americans know this intuitively. I think people feel like we're off track. If they didn't think we were off track, the president would be at 65 or 70%. And the truth of the matter is that maybe this is what America is right now. And we just have to go win the battle of convincing people by reminding them every day that the coach of their soccer team might be from South or Central America and that the Jewish synagogue down the street has folks in it that look and pray just like you do, or that the Muslim folks that are living down the street are really good neighbors and actually happen to be professor at the university, and we actually are doing better together. And I think that you have to go out there and convince them. I don't think it's just gonna be about the economy, although, quite frankly, you're starting to see the stock market fall. I don't see the president out there ballyhooing that he's responsible for that, although he was taking credit for it rising pretty exponentially. And so you never know where the economy is going to go. I think if the economy starts getting a little bit tougher, besides blaming the Fed, which he set up as a straw person two months ago, I think people have a sense of it. And then I also think, and I'm not saying this because I'm a mayor, I think cities are going to be the places where rural Americans and urban Americans find each other and continue to work with each other, notwithstanding the fact that Washington is broke. It's broke on the Democratic side and it's broke on the Republican. It just doesn't work. They can't produce something like an infrastructure bill that we know, what, like 65% of the people in America agree that crumbling, we're right down the street from Flint, right? And the water systems and the sewer systems are really gone. The roads and the bridges are collapsing. Immigration reform is really not that far away. Actually, I, I, I'll bet you right now that next week if Paul Ryan put an immigration bill on the floor and allowed it for open amendments, that the people that are in Congress right now could pass a comprehensive immigration reform bill that 65% of the Americans would support. But they don't do that in Washington. They actually really don't have an argument about real issues. They're just not on the table. They wouldn't do it like you do at your kitchen table or you do at your community meeting, and so it doesn't function. So what happens is the rest of America gets on about the business of rebuilding great cities like Detroit, which has actually found its legs again because of a lot of work of a lot of people. So you're going to run for president? I am not. You are not? I'm not. Definitively not. Well, you never say never, but no, I'm not running right now. 
<laughs> Definitively not ever. Definitively not. We have to do a Saturday Night Live skit about this. What? Are you ever going to run? No, I'm never going to run. Does that mean you're not running? No, I'm not running. Are you running right now? No, right. not at Ladies the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, he's running. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mitch Lancher. Thank you. <laughs> 